let's start with module two, which is about McCulloch Pitts neuron. So, uh, as we had done this during the history lecture way back in 1943, McCulloch and Pitts they proposed a highly simplified computational model of the brain. Right. So now let's see what's the motivation. We know that our brain is capable of very complex processing. It's capable of taking a lot of inputs from various sources, and then help us take various decisions and take various actions. Right. Now what if we want a computer to do this? Right. We want a model which is very similar to how the brain works, or at least how we think the brain works, which takes a lot of inputs and then does some processing and helps us take a decision. Right. So, what they proposed is this model, which will take a lot of inputs, and these inputs are all binary. Okay, all these inputs that you see here. These inputs are fed to this McCulloch Pitts neuron, which is an artificial neuron, and it is divided into two parts, right? So the first part collects all the inputs. So remember you had these dendrites which were taking all the information from everywhere, right? So this just collects on the information and then the second part sees what this aggregation is, right? I have collected a lot of information from all the sources. Now the second function will decide what this aggregation is and based on that it will take a decision whether to fire or not, right? And so the output is again Boolean. If it is 0, the neuron does not fire. If it is 1, the neuron fires, right? So let us take a concrete example, right? So suppose I am trying to make a decision whether I should watch a movie or not, right? So X1 could be is the genre of the movie thriller. Similarly, there could be another variable say Xn which says is the actor Matt Damon, right? So these are all various such factors, right? I could take is the director Christopher Nolan, is the music given by someone and so on, right? So all these are probably factors which help me decide whether I want to watch this movie or not, right? And we want this neuron to help us make that decision, okay? So now uh, what is happening here is these all inputs, right? They can be either excitatory or inhibitory. So let me tell you what is inhibitory first, right? So you are taking input from a lot of sources. Now say one of these sources or one of these inputs is am I ill today? Am I down with fever? So if that input is on, irrespective of who the actor, director or whatever is, right, I am not going to watch the movie, right, because I just cannot leave from my bed, right. So these are known as inhibitory inputs, irrespective of what else is on in your input features, if this input is on, your output is always going to be 0. That means the neuron is never going to fire, right. So you could think of it that suppose my, ba my mood is not good today, I do not feel like getting up or if I am if injured my leg or anything, right, if any of these conditions is on irrespective of what the other factors are, I am not going to watch the movie, right? So that is an inhibitory input. An excitatory input are in the, on the other hand is not something which will cause the neuron to fire on its own, but it combined with all the other inputs that you are seeing could cause the neuron to fire. And how? So this is how, right? So these are all the inputs that your neuron is taking. All I am going to do is I am going to take a sum of these, right? I am going to take a aggregation of all of these. So this, what does this count actually give me? The number of inputs which are on, right? The number of inputs which are value 1. That is all this aggregate. This is sum of all the 1s in my input, right? Now, this is what G does. This is a very simple function. It is just like taking a sum of my inputs. Now, the function Y takes this as the input. That means it takes this sum as the input. And if this sum is greater than a certain threshold, then it fires. If the sum is less than a certain threshold, then it does not fire, right? So again, see what is happening here. It is same as now if you depend on the actor, director, genre and so on and you find, okay, at least two of these three conditions are satisfied. At least I am happy with the actor and the director, even though the genre is not something that I care about, I will watch the movie, right? Or you might be a very niche go movie watcher who only goes to a movie if the actor matches your requirement, the director matches your requirement and the genre and the music and everything matches your requirement, right? So your threshold in that case would be high. So this is how it is going to help you make decisions, okay? Now again, a very simplified model and this is theta is called the thresholding parameter. That is the value which decides whether the neuron is going to fire or not. And this overall thing is known as the thresholding logic, okay? So this is what a McCulloch Pitts neuron looks like. Now let us implement some Boolean functions using this MP neuron. So from now on, I will just call it MP neuron and we will try to implement some Boolean functions using it, okay? So now why are we interested in Boolean functions? Because we have overly simplified the way we take decisions, right? 
we are saying that the way we take decisions is we take a lot of Boolean inputs, is actor Matt Damon, is John a thriller and so on. And based on that, we produce a Boolean output, right? So our inputs is all Booleans. So you have x1 to xn, which are all Booleans. And your output is also Boolean, right? So that's a Boolean function that you're trying to learn from x to y. Is that clear, right? Now x just happens to contain n different variables here, okay? And a lot of decision problems you could cast in this framework. You can just imagine, right? Whether to come for lecture today or not, Again, is you could cast it, it depending on various Boolean uh, inputs, right? Okay. And this is a very concise representation of the McCulloch Pitts neuron. What it says is it takes a few Boolean inputs and it has a certain threshold. If the sum of these inputs crosses this threshold, then the neuron will fire, otherwise, it will not fire, okay? That is a simple representation of the MP neuron. Now, suppose I am trying to learn the AND function. When would the AND function fire? All the inputs are on. So what should be the value of the threshold in this case? 3, everyone agrees, right? Okay. What about the OR function? 1, okay. Let us see a few more. This function. So let me tell you what this function is, right? So this, you see this circle here, right? So what that means is that this input is a inhibitory input. If that is on, then the neuron is not going to fire. That is how I am representing it. So now tell me what should the threshold for this be? It is not so hard. See if x2 is on, it is not going to fire, right? So you have 4 rows 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So 2 of those are ruled out, it is not going to fire. Now out of the remaining 2, when, did, when do you want it to fire? So what should be the threshold? 1. Everyone gets that? Anyone who does not get that? Okay, good. Now what about this function? 0 or 3? 3 is not even a valid option, okay. Uh, 0, everyone agrees to that? Fine, okay. And what about this? 0, okay. So you get this? So now if you have a certain number of input variables and the function that you are trying to model, the decision that you are trying to make is a Boolean function, then you could represent it using these MP neurons. Whether all Boolean functions can be represented in this way or not, that is still not clear. I am just showed you some good examples. We will come to the bad examples later on. Okay, here is the question, right? So, can any Boolean function be represented using a McCulloch Pitts neuron? So, before answering this question, right, so we will see a bit of a geometric interpretation of what an MP neuron is actually trying to do, okay? So, let us take the OR function where you have two inputs x1 and x2, and this neuron is going to fire if x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 1, right? That is clear? That is how the definition is, okay? Now, if you look at this, right, x1 plus x2 greater than or equal to 1, okay. Now, let us ignore the greater than part first. So, we will just talk about x1 plus x2 equal to 1. What is this? Equation of a line, everyone gets that, okay. Now, in this case, since we are dealing with Boolean inputs and we have two axes, x1 and x2, how many input points can we have? Four, right. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? So, you could have these four points. So, just note that this is an x1 and x2 axis, but only four inputs are valid here, right? This is not a real numbered axis, okay? There is only Boolean inputs possible here, okay? Now, what does a line x1 plus x2 equal to 1 tell you? Which line is that? So, one which passes through 1 comma 0 here and 0 comma 1 here, right? So, this is that line, okay? Now, what do we want? That for all those inputs, for which the output is actually 1, they should lie on, on the line or on the positive side on the line, right? And all those inputs for which the output is 0, they should lie on the other side of the line. Is that happening, right? So what is actually the MP unit actually learning? A linear decision boundary, right? It just, what it is doing in effect is actually it is dividing the input points into two halves such that all the points lying on that line, right, are, uh, sorry, all the points for which the input should be 0 lie below this line and all the points for which the output should be 1, right. Sorry, in both cases it should be have been output. So, let me just repeat it. All the points for which the output is 0 lie below this line and all the points for which the output is 1 either lie on this line or above the line, okay. Is that fine? Okay. And so let us convince ourselves about this. 
if it is not already clear from the equation. For how many of you it's already clear from the equation that this is exactly what it does for a large number of you, right? But still we'll just do a few examples and move ahead. Now for the AND function, what's the decision boundary? X1 plus X2. Oh no, that's the decision. Decision boundary equal to 2, right? Okay. So again I have these four points. Only these four points are possible. Now where is my decision line? Passing through that 1 comma 1 and intercepting this somewhere around 2 comma 0 and this around 0 comma 2, right? So that's the line which I am interested in, okay? Now again do you see uh, that our condition is satisfied that all the inputs for which we want the output to be 1 are on or above the line and all the inputs for, for which we want the output to be 0 are below the line, right? Okay. Now what about this function? What's the threshold? 0. So what would the line be? x1 plus x2 equal to 0 which passes through the origin, right? And again all the points are either on or above the line, right? So this part we are going to call as the positive half space and this we are going to call as the negative half space, okay? So far everything is fine, okay? Now what if we have more than two inputs? In a two dimensional case when we just had x1 and x2, we are trying to find a separating line. In the three dimensions case, what will we do? Plane. Okay, good. And in the higher dimensions? Hyperplane. Very good. Okay. So this is now your three dimensional case, right? Again, there are three axes here, but not all points are possible. How many points are possible? Eight, po eight points. And which is the function that we are trying to implement? All. So for these eight, out of these eight points, for how many is the output one? Seven. And for one, it's zero. So what is the kind of plane that we are looking at? We are looking for a plane such that seven points lie on or above it and one point lies below it. And which is that point? Zero comma zero comma zero, right? So now what's the equation of that hyperplane? X1 plus X2 plus X3 is equal to one. Okay, good. You see this? So you see that all the seven points are visible, but the point zero comma zero is not visible because it's on the other side of the plane, right? So this is doable in three dimensions also and again in higher dimensions also, right? You could find in hyperplane, okay. So the story so far is that a single Macaulay-Pitts neuron can be used to represent Boolean functions which are linearly separable. So a linearly separable function is such that there exists a line such that for that function, whichever points produce an output of one lie on one side of the line and whichever points produce an output zero lie on the other side of the line. This is a very informal definition. Later on, we'll try to make it more formal. Okay, so is that fine? Okay, so this is where we'll end uh, the previous module.